name is Ross the Alcheminiaturist, and this is my slug wizard hunter. Now I can already hear you asking me, Ross, what is a slug wizard? And well, it is basically exactly what you think it is. A slug wizard. Pulling straight from the website for slug wizards, the lore goes a little like this. In the year CY 500, somewhere in the region known as the Great Rift, the eccentric and slightly deranged wizard Thubja Athib was experimenting with his subterranean lab. He was trying to take on new polymorphic forms when he was interrupted by something or someone breaching his laboratory. Moments later, a massive seismic event disturbed the domicile land, and Thubja was rendered unconscious. When he had come to, he noticed to his horror, or was it delight, other odd beings moving around nearby. He caught sight of his reflection in a polished silver plate that had fallen to the floor, and he did not recognize what he saw. His skin was bumpy, and its color shifted between shades of green, purple, and gray. His legs were gone, and his arms had been replaced with tentacles. He discovered that he could extend protuberance from his tentacles and the rest of his body. He had three eyes on individual stalks that he could also extend or contract. There were other gastropod-like creatures crawling around his lab. They did, however, all share characteristics resembling those of a slug. Unknown and strange creatures wander through the Great Rift, and somehow this particular collection of repulsive creatures had become entangled in his experiment. Over time, Thubja found they were sentient, surprisingly intelligent, and naturally skilled in a variety of magics. He found that his amorphous hands could perform any number of intricate gestures needed for spellcasting and that he could form as many appendages as he needed for complex work. He became known as the Father of the Slug Wizards. For the most part, the sect of Slug Wizards is quiet, private, and keeps to itself. These wizards are magic users specializing in the spells of illusionists. They have crafted a few unique spells usable but to them alone due to their unique physical nature and peculiar grasp on magic. So now we know who and what the slug wizards are and how they came to be. But what am I doing and why am I doing it? Well it turns out that there was a competition for this year of slug wizards. Slug wizards 3, Hunter. But I'll get to that in a moment. Right now I'm finishing the first stage of the base of my hunter and using a combination of super glue and baking soda affixing the armature of the slug-like body to said hunter. Don't take too much notice of the aquarium plant. It won't be staying as later they fall off and I was just too over it to fight them to get back on. I really do like the baking soda super glue trick, so much so that I've permanently borrowed my kitchen's box of baking soda, replacing it with a newer, more fresh box, the perfect crime. But before I go too far into the build, some sawing. After taking the Lord of Plagues off the hips, and just as a side note, if you do attempt this at home, make sure you keep your fingers and any other body parts you'd like to keep and wish to keep intact and in one piece far enough away from the saw. Even a saw this small can do some damage. Practice safe hobbying. After taking the Lord of Plagues off at the hips, I then filled him with glue and soda and then attached that to the top of the armature. Not without fighting both the plants and torso to get it to stay upright and secure. Once I did that, it was time to take out the green stuff. Before green stuff is green stuff, it is blue and yellow stuff, and you need to mix it together. I have my two different stuffs in separate containers as, when they touch, they start to cure and bond, and we don't want that to happen before we're ready to use it. So the best thing you can do is buy the two parts in two separate parts, or ribbons, 
but if you can't, just cut them apart as well as you can, shave off any excess, chuck that part out, and then store them separately like I do. These containers are from the dollar store. I got three for like two dollars or something, and the third is for my silly putty. After the two parts were completely together and nice and green, I rolled it into a fat, worm-like, slug-like shape and pushed it into and around the armature to start making the rest of the body, tail, stuff. It turned out that I needed more, which, if we're being completely honest, it's better to have to make more than to try to figure out what to do with the new, curing, excess green stuff just sitting around. Had I done that, I'd just have to make some tentacles or something. It would have been used right away. But I do have a green stuff ball the size of an M&M on my desk because I did take too much on a different model a little while ago. I wanted to make sure that any and all fingerprints that I may have put onto the green stuff was not there in the end. I don't feel like this is the appropriate place for fingerprint style texture, and so I used my color shaper. I have two really nice color shapers, a flat chisel one and a taper point one. I have others in an Amazon Basics style beginner's sculpting tools set that I have just never even bothered to pull out but I assumed that they would work just as good for this. With the body done, I left it to cure for 24 hours, which is really easy as I worked on this at about 9 p.m. on Tuesday the 19th of September and came back to it on Wednesday the 20th. Those dates are important and will come up in a bit. You don't have to keep them in mind, I'll be mentioning them again. Now that the body is cured, it is time to add some bits. I had scoured my bits boxes, and they are all labeled and properly sorted, I may add, for some appropriate parts to make him look extra icky. I grabbed some parts from the Gene Stealer Acolyte kit, and the legs are from a Maggotkin Rotfly. In the end, I didn't use the Gene Stealer Cult's parts. I didn't intend to just use Maggotkin bits and parts exclusively for this build. It just worked out that way. I cut the legs to make posing them a little nicer, added super glue onto both of the connection points, dabbed the legs into some soda, and attached them on easy peasy lemon squeezy. I have to say that I took a bit of time to remark that the maggotkin of Nurgle would do well to have a hero like this, half man, half slug, in their army as an actual model. They have a snail, so why not a slug too? Next. It was on to painting. All paints will be listed in the description for this video. AK's white primer was used as usual, as I honestly love their primer. It goes on the best as I've ever found. Vallejo Beastly Brown for the chitin legs and protrusions. Vallejo Heavy Gray for the slug part, which, if we're thinking about it, this is more of a green than a gray, but it is what it is. Two Thin Coats Temple Stone for the human flesh part, as I wanted to make it look a little bit more, not dead, but definitely not well. Citadel Lead Belcher was used for all of the iron parts, the Vallejo Warlord Purple for the entrails, Vallejo Parasite Brown for the wood, Vallejo Game Effects Vomit for the pus, just a little bit, it wasn't that much. Proacryl's Bold Titanium White was used for the pustules on the skin. Citadel Averland Sunset was used on top of the Titanium White for the pustules. A dry brushed Proacryl Titanium White onto the chitinous legs and protrusions to give them a little bit more of a quick highlight right away. Again, I used Vallejo's Parasite Brown for the leather straps that it attached the small part of metal that he used for armor. Citadel Corn Red was used for a little bit of blood on the chitin, as he has seen a lot of battles and a lot of... Ah, they wouldn't be battles now, would they? I then used Citadel's Agrax Earthshade on all of the flesh, chitin, and everything but the metal. I really wanted the hunter to look dirty, worn and dirty. 
Yes, I said that twice. Because saying it twice is like doubling its power, right? The last shade I used was Nalan Oil on the few metal parts on this model to really bring the shade and grease feeling on of his blade. Finally, Scale 75's Dark Rust Oil Wash was used on top of the Nalan Oil to make sure it was rusty enough to give the feeling that he had been using the weapon for a long time taking little to no care about its wear and tear. Finally, I added Vallejo's wet mud texture to the base. And before we get to the lore of this model, I wanted to come back to the fact that I did this model in just over 24 hours for Slug Wizards 3 Hunters competition. Now I had said before that, oh, I did the green stuff on Tuesday, September 19th, and the rest on the 20th, which was last Wednesday. The competition opened up on June 21st of this year, and I had only heard about it on Monday, September 18th, when I saw an Instagram post by Hydra talking about how he needed to get his model done. So not only did I not know about this competition, I was entering at the last possible moment. When I did email my submission in, it was at about 11.40 p.m. on Wednesday the 20th, and I had forgotten to add the photos. So I had to send in a second email titled something like, Slug Wizards 3 Entry, Now With Photos. Anyway, now for his lore. It is little talked about, more of a quiet whisper told to the younger members of the community that some apprentice slug wizards venture off in search of volunteers to assist them in their mastery of the mystical arts. Some people may, in fact, be willing at first, but that gives way to regret and pleading for mercy once the apprentices start weaving spells. Most, however, seem to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and find themselves cornered by an apprentice or two and at their mercy until they believe their quota and mastery are complete. Velhar was one such individual, caught between a rock and a hard place, so to speak. Nowhere to run, and no place to hide, when a trio of apprentices fell upon him, casting spells on and through him, breaking down who and what he originally was, and reforming it into an image of their liking. Due to their haste and inexperience, they were not fully able to change him into what they had hoped for, and discarded him, much like a child who once their toy had no more use to them. Velhar, believing that he would not be welcomed nor recognized as his village, fled from everything he knew in search of something newer and safer. As the days and nights melted and folded into themselves, Velhar started to feel seeds of hate and bitterness towards those apprentices who changed him. Once those seeds took root, they pushed out any feelings of fear he had for any wizard. At the next village he came across, he waited until the dead of night so that he could steal provisions and any equipment he could find. Armed with a heavy axe and some pieces of armor, Velhar was ready. Ready to never be prey again. Ready to never look over his shoulder to see if they were back to experiment more. Ready to become the hunter. And that's it. Thank you very much for taking this journey with me. Please don't forget to leave a like, comment, and even subscribe if you're new. And don't forget to keep your brushes wet and your models painted. Goodbye.